back um, talking about being called to hope and uh, what is uh, the hope of our calling. And we look today at one aspect of this, which is the weight of eternity. We looked um, previously at the hope of resurrection, of life after death. Uh, that was last week. And uh, here we will look at uh, the weight of eternity in the um, in the picture in in the big picture of the scriptures um, to understand that you know what is uh, I guess what is important and what is meaningful um, in um, this life is really not in this life. It is the things that are coming next. Um, sorry, I need a second here. There we go. All right. We got here from 1 Peter 1 and verses 3 and 4 where we read about God in mercy caused us to be born again. When you become a Christian, you're born again. And one of the things to which you are now born is a different inheritance. Inheritances are based on how you're born. And this one is one that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That is eternity. That is the thing that is imperishable, that is undefiled, and is unfading, and is kept in heaven. That is eternity. So the first lesson about eternity, I think, is to talk about where the heart is. Because our hope, our inheritance, is in heaven. It's Matthew 6 and Luke 12 is uh, similar, but Matthew 6... It's verses 19 to 21, where Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, because why lay them up in heaven? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that's the first point about this inheritance that we are born to again in Christ Jesus is that heaven is where the heart should be, the treasure. What is it that we treasure, that we value, that's important to us? This ought to be heaven. It ought to be eternity. Where the treasure is is where the heart will be. The heart follows what you treasure, what you care about, what you save for, what you protect Right, all of that that you're treasuring, that's where your heart is. And so if you care about eternity, you care about heaven, then that's where the heart will be. And isn't that the right place for the heart? I think so. Luke 12 is very similar, but I want to look at him a little bit more in detail. Beginning at 29, he said, Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Every nation of the world looks for these things, and your Father knows that you need them. So the first thing is that God is our Father, and He knows that we need them. It's not hidden from Him that we have this physical need in the body. But don't look for that. Don't worry about that, He said. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. The key to having what you need in the body is looking after the Spirit. Seek his kingdom and these will be added. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We, we, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be concerned. When we seek his kingdom, we have a promise he will take care of us. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves instead money bags that do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. 
We have to be of that mindset, that the heart is so much in eternity and in the kingdom of God that we focus instead on generosity, sharing, kindness. Where no thief approaches, no moth destroys in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be too. Again, the heart is, is there. What is it we care for, tend for, tend to rather? Protect, think about. Now I'm going to take a bit of a different approach here when we talk about moths and rust and thieves. And I would go back to the book of Ecclesiastes for a little bit here. Let's identify moths and rust and thieves. Um, you may or may not have experience with moths in the closet, but what happens is you go to the closet to pull out a garment, say something that was for winter, which of course we only have about six weeks of, and you go pull it out of there to put it on and suddenly it's got holes everywhere. <laughs> like what happened here? Those are moths. Moths destroyed those things. Rust happens to cars, garage doors, tools, everything. <laughs> and thieves, thieves break in and steal. Now, that's always true, and that's true of many different ways and many different cases, right? We know what those are. But Ecclesiastes lay, lays it out for us in the big picture, and I think that's important. First thing I want to look at is 18 to 21 of the second chapter, where this king says, I hated all my work or toil that I worked in under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he'll be master of everything for which I worked and used my wisdom under the sun. This too is vanity. Vanity in the sense of, well, there's nothing to be done about it. It's it's vanity and it's empty. It's an empty pursuit to try and do something about this. You can't do anything about it. I said, I came to resent working in a sense because I would work and I would labor and I would use my wisdom and build something up. But the fact is, I must leave it to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that one will be wise or foolish. Nobody knows. There's no telling what they're going to do with it after you're gone. This is moths, rust, and thieves, you understand. People think, well, I'm going to leave something to the next generation. Is that a good idea? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. It depends on whether the next generation is wise or foolish. Well, I'm going to make sure. No, you can't make sure. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. Uh, raise up a child. Well, yes, you raised them the right way. You were raised as well. You have parents, too. No, the fact is you're going to leave and you're going to leave this stuff here and the next generation is going to do with it whatever they feel like. And they might be wise. I hope they are. Or they might be foolish. I hope they aren't. But it's going to happen. So then he said, I turned around, gave up my heart to despair over the toil of my labor under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom Knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone else, someone who didn't work for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. True, you can work hard, save up, do everything right by the book, you know. And then, boop, oh, you're leaving now. I didn't think I was done yet. I had something else to say. But now that's not how it works, friend. You don't get to decide when it's over. God decides when it's over. He said, you know, if your trust is in those riches and in those things, then you give up your heart to despair. That leads to despair. If your hope is in this life, in this world, and the things that you're saving up for, you know, this generation that follows or your family or whatever else, that leads to despair because the fact is, you're going to have to leave it. And you don't have control over what happens to it after you were gone, if you have control of it now. This too is vanity, meaning there's not much that you can do about this. 
basically there's nothing you can do about this. And a great evil in the sense that that really hurts, that really stings. I worked hard, I used my mind, I, I scrambled and, and scraped and, and right, but you don't get to take it with you. And the person who's going to get it didn't work for it. That's the way life is. Ecclesiastes 4, more moths rust than thieves. Look at this. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, no son, no brother, and yet there's no end to all his work. His eyes are never satisfied with riches. He never asks, for whom am I working? And depriving myself of pleasure, this too is vanity, an unhappy business. Here this man has got riches, he has what he needs, but his eyes are never satisfied. He doesn't have a, a family member, a dependent, somebody else that, that is waiting or, or needs the support. He's got riches, but it's never enough. And he never stops to say, why am I working all this much? That's all he does is work. Well, why? It's a kind of moth, rust, and thief, you know. Time, time can be a thief. Overtime can be a thief. Dedication to the company can be a thief, you understand. You've got to think about this, that all these things are temporary. They're not going with you. What the Ecclesiastes actually draws as the conclusion is that the best thing for us is to work diligently and to enjoy the labor of our hands. Enjoy your food, enjoy your spouse. That is the blessing of God. If you can enjoy those things, that's great. But another moth would be Ecclesiastes 5, 13 to 16. Here's a grievous evil I've seen, riches kept by the owner to his own hurt. Those riches were lost in a bad venture. This happens too. You hang on to the money. You keep hanging on to it. You hang on, hang on. Not yet, not yet. I'm going to keep saving. I'm going to keep saving. And then the savings and loans crisis hits, right? Or the banks default. Or the government changes the currency. Or a war breaks out. Yeah, held on to it and held on to it. Pinched and pinched. And then it disappeared. Does it happen? Yes, it happens. It certainly does. It can happen, yes. This is not guaranteed. And this man is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. So the way that he was born, naked from the womb, that's how he's going. That's how all of us are going. But this one especially, who lost everything he had saved, because he was saving everything. And he'll take nothing for his toil that he may carry in his hand. Just as he came by the way, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? If your trust is in riches, is, is in the money of the work, in the achievements, the accomplishments, that's wind. It's not guaranteed. It comes and it goes. Moths, rust, and thieves can affect these things. Chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes, there is an evil I've seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of everything he desires, and yet God doesn't give him power to enjoy them. A stranger enjoys them instead. This is vanity and grievous. Well, it's true. This happens. Sometimes a person comes to have everything that they want, and then... They don't get a chance to enjoy it. Somebody else takes over. 
something happens. It gets taken from them. Lost in an adventure, in a, in a, in a business venture, lost in an investment, lost whatever. Some cataclysm, some person you trusted was not trustworthy. Whatever it might be. There are all kinds of embezzlement schemes. You know, you can see it all the time on the news. Sometimes a person has everything in this life. Wealth, possessions, honor. But then he can't enjoy them. Yeah, that does happen. This is vanity. I mean, it's vain to trust in those things. To think that it's about honor and possessions and wealth. That's vain. That's empty. That's useless. It's not true. You can't count on them. Because of moths, rust, and thieves. Well, why are we saying this? Because our hope is in heaven. What we're saying is these are the things that the world seeks after. The world wants the wealth, the savings, the, you know, the thought about the future, the next generation leaving something for them, doing better for them. And these are, you know, in some measure, they're reasonable things. We're all working and trying to do the best we can to plan and think about what might be happening. But in point of fact, none of those things are guaranteed and they are not the issues of life. If we go back to Luke, the bigger context for Luke when he talks about moths, thieves, and rust is that you do not know what comes next. It's Luke 12, 15 down to 21. Jesus warned the people, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness or greed. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It's not what we have and how much of it or how little of it. He also told a parable to go with this. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. This man has the problem that he has so much food, he has nowhere to store it. You notice that he did not decide to distribute food to the poor and the needy. He said, I'll do this. I will tear down my existing barns and build larger ones where I will store all the grain and all the goods. So up until now, these barns have been enough, haven't they? They provided for him and his family, but now he has so much that he's going to tear those down and build bigger ones to hold on to it all instead of sharing it, instead of helping the needy. You see how it works? Oh, I'll hold on to this. And then I'll tell myself, self, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, tonight your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's the parable Jesus told. This is the, the thing behind Ecclesiastes. He's got what he thinks is everything and he's made room and he's saved it all up. He's not going to enjoy it. He's not going to get any of it because he's going to die that night. His time is up. It yielded plentifully. He didn't know what to do with the produce and increase. He decided on a thing that he would do to set a plan in motion to keep it all. And then he died that day. This happens. But this is what it's like to lay up treasure for yourself without being rich towards God. That concern, you know, where is the heart? Where is the treasure? What matters really matters. Because you don't know what's next. The fact is nobody knows what's next. <laughs> nobody ever knows what is next. <laughs> I don't say it to scare you. I just say it to, to say, you know, Wake up, realize we don't have, we don't have that. We don't know. If you go back to Ecclesiastes in chapter eight, we'll keep going with the idea of what's next. It says there in chapter eight, verses five down through eight, that the way to handle this is to live right. 
Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise will know the proper time and the just way. The wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. What he means by this is when you keep the commandment of the Lord God, the great king, you will know no evil. That doesn't mean bad stuff won't happen to you in life. It means you're doing the right thing. You'll know the right time and the right way. There is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. He doesn't know what is to be. Who can tell him how it will be? Truth. We don't know what is coming next, and nobody can tell us what is coming next. No man has power to retain the spirit. No man has power over the day of death. That's a fact. We cannot say, no, I'm not going to die. No, God, I'm holding on to my spirit. It's not going to go to eternity. It's not going to cross over. No, you, you can't do that. Nobody can do that. Nobody has power over that. There's no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those given to it. Yeah, there's no discharge from war. When it's your time, it's your time, man. That's what it means. Wickedness won't deliver those who are given to it. Keeping the command is what get, delivers people. It makes the heart wise, keeping the command of the great king. Man's trouble lies heavy on him because he doesn't know what is to be. And who can tell him how it's going to be? Yeah, you can't. Nobody has power over the day of death. There's no telling what is next. And in Ecclesiastes 9, 11 and 12, are these things stated in this way that's fairly simple? Again, I saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor is the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. That's correct. We want to believe that the race is to the swift. The fastest person finishes the race. Well, yeah, in some proverbial sense, that's basically how it goes. But you've got to understand that time and circumstance, time and chance, happen to them all. Who's in the race? How did they get in the race? I'm not in the race. Why am I not in the race? Because I don't run. If you see me run, you better run too. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I wasn't born with the genetics to run with the athlete's broad shoulders and musculature. Some people are. Those are the people who are in the race. What did that have to do with me? Nothing. It was time and circumstance. <laughs> and as for the athletes who are there, what happened to the fastest person? Well, they slipped. Why did they slip? Time and circumstance. The foot came down in the wrong place at the wrong time. You understand what he's saying. The battle's not to the strong. True, you would like to believe that our strength, our power, is what determines our success. And to some degree, yes, proverbially, but the fact is, any given battle can go any given way. You don't know. Things happen. Storms come up. Power outages come up. Hailstones fall out of the sky when you fight the ancient army of Israel. <laughs> you have no idea what's going to happen. That's all he's saying. Time and chance happen to them all. Everything is overtaken by time and chance. He's not saying don't work. He's not saying don't make the effort. He's saying don't count on it, friend. It's not guaranteed. Man doesn't know his time. Like fish taken in an evil net, like birds caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Yeah, fish taken in the net, I mean, they didn't even know the net existed. And boop, they're out, they're out of the water. Everything has changed. The scene is suddenly different, something they've never seen before. 
Birds caught in a snare also are not aware of snares, and suddenly they cannot fly. Their life is, is changed. It's over. So it is with mankind. Man doesn't know his time. It suddenly falls upon them. Nobody expects to die. Nobody expects to die tonight for their soul to be required of them. And I'm not saying for you to live in anxiety and fear of death. I'm saying to you, look, you can't count on those things. That's not where your treasure should be. That's not where your heart should be. Those are all temporary things. They might work out. They might not. You might get to enjoy them. You might not. There is something far better, according to Paul. If you look at the first chapter of Philippians, he wrote to them about the fact that he was in jail for the testimony of Christ, and yet... 12, 13, and 14 of Philippians 1. He said, you know, brothers, I want you to know what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's become known through the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He said, I want you all to understand this. Yes, I'm in jail in Rome because that's where the imperial guard is. He said, but this thing that's happened to me, it has actually served to advance the gospel. That's a good thing in some sense. He's not saying he's enjoying jail. He's saying something good is coming of this. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This is a good thing. that they will speak without fear, that the word is becoming known, that it's spreading through the authority at Rome. That is good. But how is that good when he's in jail? Well, it's the 21st through the 24th verses. He said, you know, to, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is to serve Jesus, not self, to die is gain. Why is that gain? Because it's eternity. It's our reward. It's where our inheritance is. That's when you come into the mansions that God has prepared for you and the, and the inheritance that is unfading, imperishable, eternal. If I'm to live in the flesh, he said, well, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. He said, you know, you ask me my preference. Would I prefer that they execute me or would I prefer that they release me? He said, I don't really have a preference. <laughs> How can you have no preference in such a matter as this? Well, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It would be better to be with Jesus and to be done with all this mess. That'd be better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And so he knows because he needs to serve God and he is an apostle appointed to teach the nations and to write these things. And he knows there's work to do and he'll stay and he'll do the work until it's done. And yet my desire is to depart and be with Christ. That's far better. You know, if you're asking you know, what do I think would be more enjoyable? It'd be more enjoyable to be in heaven. That's true. It would be more enjoyable to be in heaven. That is far better. And this is the idea when we speak of the weight of eternity. It's far better than anything we have here on earth. And we do have blessings on earth. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be down on everything. I'm just trying to put forth what the scriptures teach about this. That however good it is here, heaven is better. Whatever promise, you know, this life might have in it, a return on investment or whatever else, the promise of heaven is far better. The weight of eternity is that it outweighs everything here. But it's incredible, isn't it, to look at Paul and realize what he's saying, that He's in prison, yeah, but it's working out for the good and that the gospel is spreading and the preachers are emboldened. That's good. 
And he said, it's not the worst thing if they execute him. He'll be in heaven and that's good. This is true. <laughs> that's reality. It's true. If we should be destroyed for our faith in God, our estate in heaven is great and blessed. I don't want that to happen. I would rather that the world accept Jesus and that the world accept the Christ and join us in the service of God. I much would rather that, yes. And yet I understand that heaven is worth it. And heaven is better. If you look over in Romans 8, he said this about it. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Which is to say, Dada. <laughs> That's what that means. And this goes all the way back, if you will. It brings us round, Robin, I guess, to 1 Peter 1, remember, where he said, We are born again to an inheritance, undefiled, unfading, imperishable, kept in heaven. You didn't fall back into slavery. You have received a spirit of adoption as sons. You're born again. You're a son, a child of God, son or a daughter, but a child of God. God is our Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. That's the inheritance we talked about. We're heirs of God because we're children of God. We're born again in God when we obey the gospel of Jesus. And we're heirs of God, fellow heirs along with Jesus, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The way Paul reckons this, when he does the math on this thing, the sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy of comparison to the glory that is coming. That's what we mean by that is far better. When we speak of the weight of eternity, we're talking about putting it on a balance or on a scale. There isn't something else you can put on the other side of the scale that will budge eternity. Its weight is so immense. The sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. The weight of eternity is so immense, there's nothing you can put on this side of the scale that will budge it. It won't move. It won't be changed. Heaven is worth it all. And hell is worth nothing. There's nothing in this life that we choose to engage in or to compromise for that is worth hell. It's also eternal. But we are called to something far better. And so the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of comparison with the glory that is coming. He's saying that we are called to adoption. We are adopted by God. He is our Father. We have an inheritance eternal, and it far outweighs whatever we pay for it here. Whatever sufferings we go through here, they'll be lost in the rear, viewer, rear view mirror of eternity. You forget things that happened a long time ago. You forget things that happened not even that long ago. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't have a second child. <laughs> of course you forget. If you were thinking of the pain of childbirth or whatever else, then you wouldn't go do that again. But you do forget. And the joys outweigh it. It's worth it. Eternity, how much more so, you know? If in this life we can come to go back to something that was hard, how much more in the rearview mirror of eternity this life will just get smaller and smaller and smaller, further and further away? And so in the rest of Romans 8, we look at the 24th verse. 
and 25th, 24 and 25. In this hope we are saved. We were saved. Those of us who have been saved were saved in this hope, the hope of eternity. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And that's the call today. Do you believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God? Are you prepared to put to death the old person and be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus, born again to an inheritance imperishable, eternal? That's not something that is seen. It's something that is future. So when we think about the, the, uh, the moths, the rust, the thieves, all the scenarios that Ecclesiastes laid out, those are all things that you can see. Heaven and eternity cannot be seen except with spiritual eyes in the pages of God's Word. But we, hope, we do hope for what we don't see. And when you understand that God is real and God's promise is real, then you live for God today. You make choices for Him today. That's what it is to wait for it with patience. Why patience? Well, it takes patience because there is suffering. There are setbacks. There are losses in this life. It will take patience, but it's worth it. Heaven is worth everything that you pay for it and more, many times over immeasurably. If you believe in Jesus, repent. Put God first in your heart. Be buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Be washed in that blood of Jesus and resurrected a new person in him, created in him for good works. If today you have already done these things and are a Christian, let us work with you in the Spirit. If you are needing repentance, if you have fallen away, repent, make things right in your prayers, but also let us pray with you to work on your behalf for God. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, there's water prepared, nothing hinders you. Be ready for eternity because we don't know when it starts. We don't know when the last day is. We don't know when God will call us back. If today you need to obey the gospel, you need to, the, to ask for the prayers of the saints. Let that need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.